one of the main areas that I've worked on is this idea of trying to better target cancers with treatments. The cancer cell, like all the cells in our body, has like a protective coating over it. And my area has been studying the sugars that are within that protective coating. It's an area called glycobiology. And now I'm working with particularly one company, but also I've been working previously with other companies, looking at drugs that will prevent that sugar coating that's on top of those cells. A big step forward for our lab was discovering that we can essentially feed cancer cells with certain drug, uh, drugs to stop these sugars, make them more leaky, and then make the chemotherapeutics work better in them. So I feel that that was a really um, a big sort of step change when we, did, when we published that paper. Hello and welcome to Different Conversations, where every week we have a different academic from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, University of Westminster, come along and talk about their work, their research, and what they're up to, and just generally chat about what they're doing and how interesting it is. This week from the School of Life Sciences, we've got Professor Miriam Dweck. Miriam, perhaps you could introduce yourself. I'm Miriam Dweck. I'm a cancer researcher. I'm a professor of cancer biology at the University of Westminster. Um, I'm very, very passionate about cancer biology and other aspects of biology. And I'm a mum and uh, a daughter and a sister. And um, I'm also interested in having a work-life balance. I'm, I'm into looking after myself and also uh, sculpture and artistic um, things which I enjoy as well in my in my spare time. You've got to be the only professor I've ever talked to who introduces themselves by saying, I also really work on having a work-life balance. <laughs> and I think that's really admirable because you do such an awesome, incredible work, but you also are really good at having that balance. How do you manage that? Uh, I made a conscious decision to, to, to have a work-life balance um, after I got ill, actually, a few years ago. I got a little bit of burnout. Um, I think I was trying to do too much to, um, and not enough for myself. And after that time, which was about six or seven years ago, I decided that I had to make a really conscious effort to look after myself. And I thought, you know, how shall I do that? And obviously I'm interested in um, the artistic endeavors. I love the human form. I love um, life drawing, which I'm not that great at, um, but I love looking at it and seeing how other artists approach it. And I also really, really love sculpture. And I sort of decided to get involved with uh, sculpture and do um, life sculpture, which is a hobby outside of work, but which I really, really enjoy. And in fact, I really enjoy the art science interface as well. I think there's a lot uh, going on in that space. And we did some projects at Westminster, which sort of fitted in that space as well. So it sort of combined my love of science with with my love of arts. But yeah, you have to make a conscious effort to find time. Because you're a professor of cancer research and I want to talk to you about cancer. This is why we have you here. Uh, the World Cancer Awareness Day is coming up and we're trying to release this podcast on that day. But I'm just gonna take all those questions and put them in a ball and put them aside for a second because this is really interesting and this is something I didn't know about you and I've known you for a number of years. <laughs> This is fantastic. So like, is there ever any, you kind of hinted there was a chance to cross over your two loves about your, your I assume there's a love of research. Most researchers yeah, 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 really yeah, are yeah. passionate about their work and this uh, artistic sculptural side of you. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I think it fed into my um, love of arts anyway, um, being a biologist, because we learn about form, human form. Of course, you, you do all the anatomy and physiology yourself. Um, if you think back, even going back to the Middle Ages, um, there's been so much depiction of both healthy humans as well as humans in the sort of naturalistic sense. If you think a very famous painting by um, Rubens of Bathsheba, which is apparently his lover, he actually showed um, 
her breast and it was clear in, in one of the paintings of her breast that she had breast cancer, advanced breast cancer. And so we know that um, artistic endeavor can tell us a lot about science, but also from science, we can learn a lot about art. And my science has actually turned into a 3D endeavor, uh, what we, we would call um, previously a lot of cancer and other medical research has been what we would might call flat biology, where we look at cellular structures in a sort of planar system on a flat plastic like a petri dish but more recently my research has gone into a 3d form and i wonder how much of that is fed by actually my excitement about um, sculpture which i've been doing now for some years so yeah i'm not that great but i enjoy it <laughs> i'm so pleased to discover this. this is why i like having these conversations because we try and have a different conversation just slip the name in there and this is the stuff that comes out of it that's fantastic so let's Let's talk about your work then for a little bit. Let's talk about cancer, which is a slightly more serious topic than sculpture, but you know, it's um, a genuinely interesting one. Yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna start off with a, a very cliche question, I guess. And so forgive me for doing so, but we've made such incredible strides in um, cancer survival rates and cancer treatments. Are we going to end up at any point soon in a post-cancer world? Or to put it another way, are we going to one day cure cancer? I think that we will certainly move much further towards prevention. So it's quite well recognized and acknowledged that possibly at least 30 to 40% of cancers could be preventable. Um, so we know that um, from work that has been done elsewhere but we know we know that from all sorts of modeling um, in terms of the cancers that are diagnosed what we are seeing in western and you know high uh, economically um, affluent countries is that there is a move towards earlier diagnosis that's not the case for all cancers but for many of the cancers now and the earlier that you diagnose a disease the greater the chance that um, surgical incision and other treatments will start to work better and so survival will we have seen these increases in survival rates the issue oftentimes is translating that into a global setting and that's something that I've been really interested in as well. Um, and we learned so much from uh, different parts of the world and cancer rates and people's behaviors and their environment and how that feeds into both cancer incidents as well as survival. So we know that the survival rates differ um, in different parts of the world when you, when you look at different survival rates of cancer. And that's not only about treatment, that's also about environment. So, um, and I say environment in the broadest sense, you know, not only, you know, what's imposed on us by the environment, but also the environment that we perhaps have choice or don't have choice uh, in adopting. So in summary, I would say we're probably not going to cure it, <laughs> but I think that we, as we will move on, as the decades move on, we would certainly see fewer cancers um, because they'll be more preventable. And I think that the ones that we do see will hopefully be more, more treatable, which is what the trend has been over the decades. Mm -hmm. So like, that's, there's so much in there to, to ask about, to talk about, because like you say, there's prevention, there's treatment, there's global differences and occurrence, and there's all these lifestyle factors that are, are so relevant. I thought it was really interesting, that idea about early detection in the Western world, uh, because one of the notes I have got on my little list of questions here to talk to you about today is from um, one of the uh, cancer... Uh, research charities in the UK. I forget which one, and I'll look it up and put it in the uh, comments below. But they mentioned that breast cancer survival today in the United Kingdom, if it's only located in the breast when discovered, is 99% at five years. That's an insane statistic. And so when you start seeing such incredible survival rates, is that driven by this early detection that we're seeing, or is it driven by better treatment options that we're seeing emerge at the moment? Or is it some combination of the two, do you think? It's a combination of the two, but I'd just like to unpick the statistics a little sure, bit with absolutely. you first, if that's okay. So um, uh, breast cancer 
can be diagnosed as an invasive type of tumour, mm -hmm. which has already um, gone from being located within the ducts of the breast, the ducts that mm -hmm. bring the milk to the infant, or the lobules, which we think of like the bunches of grapes that might hold the milk. Mm -hmm. So um, if the cancer remains within the ducts or the lobules, then it, um, that is considered what we call in situ. It remains within. I and think, yeah. and that in situ type of cancer is not the same necessarily as an invasive cancer. And so when we look at uh, the statistics that you quoted me just there, uh, that 99%, that will include both the in situ and the invasive. So if we sort of take the two apart and we say, let's just look at the invasive, which are the ones which really are the ones which have gone in outside of the duct uh, and moved into the surrounding tissue, the, the sort of one that we might consider the true, true, true cancer. Um, the survival rate from women in the UK, well, because most breast cancers are in women, uh, so that I'm quoting female survival rates, um, but the survival rate is, is approximately 85% uh, percent over five years. So yeah, it's much, much better than it was um, 20 years ago when I started working cancer research. The survival rate was only 50% at five years. So we've seen a massive improvement in survival rates. And yes, it's a combination of uh, smaller tumors being detected, better treatments online, batteries of treatments. So if you relapse on one, having another treatment to um, go, go at uh, that tumor with. And so... Yes, um, survival rates are much, much better. I don't think they're at the 99% yet, but they are approaching that, uh, yeah. That's, that's even that, that kind of shift from being a literal flip of a coin yeah. to something like 85%, that's an incredible shift. Yeah, it's amazing. And I think that when I first started working in cancer research, oftentimes people would say to me, you know, how can you work in that area? It must be so depressing, um, you know, because I was looking at a lot of patient records for my research and finding samples to use in the research and whatsoever. And it was, I mean, it was really, really, you know, very sad uh, having that sort of survival rate. But you see, the, the thing is, if you stay with something, as I have with this, I've been fortunate to be able to stay in this field and to see these improvements, you know, it really gives you, a, it's very heartening and it's very, very satisfying also. I imagine it must be because you've seen, uh, and you say you've been in this area for a, a long period of time. Uh, and I, I won't name years for uh, due difference, but it, it hasn't been that long. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, a few decades of work, but yeah. It's, I think it's incredible how fast we're going. And it is, I mean, that's, oh, sorry, carry on. Well, in terms of the speed of progress of cancer research, it has been phenomenal. And um, it's largely, a lot of it has been driven because of the genomic revolution, um, understanding the genomic landscape, enabling us to really understand, you know, which pathways within the cell are altered and mutated and whatsoever uh, through this cancerous process. And I think that all the cards are sort of stacked up through methodology and groundwork. And and now it's almost as though we feel like we're on such a roll because we've got the tools that we need. It's taken a long, long time to get those tools ready. But now we have so many tools. We don't have everything that we would like. And I, I work a lot on methods and tools. Um, but we have so much more than we had perhaps 20 years ago. And so it really speeds up the work as well, which I think is very satisfying. And if I can ask you to... Uh perhaps be a little, uh, I can't even think of the word, but uh, self-promoting, if you will. You've played a role in this. So what, what's been your kind of contribution over this uh, recent change in recent work? What are your big hits? Um, so I've worked on a number of areas, but one of the main areas I've worked on is this idea of trying to better target cancers with treatments. And one of the issues 
with cancer is that the cancer cell, like all the cells in our body, has like a protective coating over it. And my area has been studying the sugars that are within that protective coating. It's an area called glycobiology. And I have spent a long time getting methods going to study these so-called glycans and properly know what's going on within those cells. And now I'm working with uh, particularly one company, but also I've been working previously with other companies, looking at drugs that will prevent that, sh that sugar coating that's on top of those cells. And so a big step forward for our lab was discovering that we can essentially feed cancer cells with certain drug, uh, drugs to stop these sugars, make them more leaky, and then make the chemotherapeutics work better in them. So I feel that that was a really um, a big sort of step change when we did, when we published that paper, um, because we'd we'd thought that that would happen for a long time, but we had to do a lot of different experiments to work out whether or not it really did happen, and the quite fiddly ones as well, um, which we managed to do. And yeah, we, our hypothesis was correct if you feed the cancer cells, particular inhibitors, we call them, to stop those uh, that protective coating on there, then we can get the drugs in better. And I think that that will be the future actually for cancer, as we know anyway, that it's combination treatments that patients are going to be having. So it's very exciting moving it from the basic science to you know, going on through the various um, processes with this. So that's one of the big areas. The other big area, if you'd like me Absolutely, to, um, is that I um, I was in the fortunate position of um, becoming principal investigator for what is in fact the largest study of breast cancer patients' diets and lifestyle in the UK, where we have um, a cohort of patients for, collected from 55 different hospitals around the UK, where they've provided a lot of different information about their own personal diets and behavior. And with um, Claire Robertson, we've worked really, really hard to catalog what these patients have told us. And with, the, with an, a group in Oxford, we've started to look at the survival patterns of those patients as well. So I think that that com combination of doing the laboratory work, but also looking at the patients is, is really, it's really great to be able to do both. I think that's really cool. And um... Uh, to put my scientist hat back on for a second, one of my favorite ways of approaching any topic in the life sciences is doing that basic science with tiny little hard to understand things in a petri dish, but also seeing some sort of real outcome of that in real people. And it's fantastic you how to span that uh, breadth, if you will, with actual clinical impact, which is really exciting. If it's, it's really working, it's so cool. Um, in terms of you, in terms of this patient work you talked about where you've been tracking people's lifestyle factors, uh, I think this is really interesting. And again, this feeds into, well, I'm interested because it's kind of in my research area. So I try not to bring that too much in, but <laughs> what, so you're talking about identifying lifestyle factors or environmental factors that can help with uh, survivability. So what kind of stuff are you identifying? What do you think these key variables are? Well, the study was set up actually because we know that the survival pattern of women in uh, in China from breast cancer in the Far East um, is better than women in, in the UK. And it, that's always been a bit of a conundrum as to understanding why. And the clue probably is within the diet because the medical care um, is much more more similar to ours than it, it was perhaps some years before. And so we've been taking a particular focus in the lab on a group of compounds called phytoestrogens, which are compounds, actually, we always think of them as mainly being found in uh, soy, in soy, in the, in the soybean, and therefore in tofu and um, tempeh and other foodstuffs that are eaten in the Far East quite a lot. Um, but actually, um, what is less well known is that there are a group of phytoestrogens which are in the much more conventional Western and Mediterranean diets. 
And those phytoestrogens might be found in foods like um, brassica, so the sort of, um, you know, cabbages and so on like that. And also, funnily enough, in also coffee and very abundant in hops, so therefore found also in beer, which is a bit of a double-edged sword. But anyway, so we do know that within the Western diet, a conventional sort of Western and not Mediterranean and Northern European diet, there are phytoestrogens um, in that diet. And uh, anyway, so we've been trying to bridge the gap between what patients consume and what is the likely amounts in this in uh, actually ingested and in the, going around in their blood. Now we know that exposure to estrogen is a driver for breast cancer for um, because many breast cancers overexpress the receptor for estrogen. Um, is estrogen is an important hormone in the breast as it happens. Um, so we are interested in that because one of the most important anti-breast cancer treatments has been uh, um, a type of drug called tamoxifen and there's new generations of drugs which essentially block the function of the estrogen receptor. Uh, consumptions of these may well be protective against breast cancer recurrence. But um, like all things, it's probably a best thing to say all things in moderation, which is a phrase that we're quite familiar with, I think, um, in that um, some people do take very, very high amounts of these when they get a breast cancer diagnosis. And we're also looking into whether or not that has a deleterious effect or whether, and so on. So essentially, we're particularly interested in phytoestrogens, but we also know um, that there is a link between breast cancer progression and obesity and how that plays into breast cancer survivals. And the reason for that is that we know that the fat cells in the, in the human body um, act as a reservoir for precursor compounds, which are then converted into estrogens. So um, it's quite interesting because postmenopausal women who don't produce estrogen because they're postmenopausal or were thought not to produce estrogen because they're menopausal, um, were since found to benefit from anti-estrogen receptor type treatments in breast cancer. That was always a question as to why that might be. Uh, you know, it was an unknown um, phenomenon why that why it would happen that way, that women who apparently don't shouldn't have been producing estrogens because they were postmenopausal should benefit from these drugs. And since then, we've obviously discovered that those women who are, uh, have a large reservoir of adipose tissue um, have higher circulating levels of estrogen. And so therefore this idea of um, weight gain post-menopause being associated with breast cancer risk, and then of course, poorer survival after diagnosis. So we're looking at that. Um, and we've got some really interesting findings actually that have been written up um, for publication and we're hoping to publish those quite soon because um, yeah, it's gonna be an interesting story about that. Uh, just going back to the diet work though. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've met a lot of patients with breast cancer and sadly had family members who've had breast cancer and I've had a lot of experience of breast cancer. And one of the first things people say to me is, oh, you know, all the things you know about breast cancer, can you tell me what diet I should adopt? And actually, I think it's a, a real shame that we still have so much work to do to explain to individuals what they can actually do to help themselves. Now, not everyone wants to necessarily, you know, change their lifestyle or whatsoever after they've had a, a diagnosis with cancer. But we do know as well from our own study that around about 50% of all women who've been diagnosed with breast cancer make quite major changes to their diet within the first year after diagnosis. So there's a, there's a sense that, that patients want to do something for themselves but they don't always know what that should be. And I think that needs to be grounded in evidence. And so we're very excited about providing that evidence and moving that story forward. And so did that, um, that kind of drive to see some sort of evidence-based behavior change lead towards the breast cancer cookbook then? Was that where that came from? Absolutely. Give that a little subtle plug. 
Because we can do that. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I'm just thinking, where is it? I got it on my bookcase somewhere. I was looking um, for my copy as well before this, I have to admit. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to see uh, where it is. But um, yeah, I mean, that was another fantastic collaboration that Claire Robertson and myself, and uh, sadly now a late surgeon of breast cancer surgeon from UCL, uh, Professor Keshkar, who passed away. Um, we worked on it together um, because exactly what we had observed from individuals coming to our laboratory and looking at our research as well as our own personal experience, uh, Claire and I, was what Mo Keshkar had said, look, you know, my patients are calling out for advice on this, but there's such a lot of literature and they don't know where to get information sometimes. And um, sometimes also there's some really bad things in the literature which are not based on evidence perhaps so we wanted to debunk some of these myths that are out there um, and we wanted to also make a book that would have really yummy recipes that could be inspiring for people uh, when you're having chemotherapy sometimes you know, appetite's not going to be that good, but, and you don't really, always, people don't always know what to cook, but oftentimes family members might want to make a really nice meal or, you know, close loved one, loved ones might want to help each other. So that was the motivation for the cookbook. Um, and all of the recipes, as Claire will tell you, have been painstakingly evaluated in terms of their nutritional content to make sure they don't have, you know, that. Uh, we, but not inadvertently putting too much sugar or too much fat or too many other things which might be um, unhealthy. Um, so, yeah, I'm really proud of that cookbook. And it was a lot of work, but it was worth it. Um, just from the feedback we had from patients who wrote to us. Um, I have to admit, uh, I've bought yeah. two copies in my life and I can't oh, find really? either of them right now because I was trying to find one for this podcast. <laughs> I definitely gave one away as a gift, but I can't find the other one. But fantastic book, great read. Fantastic you know, photography and really delicious recipes. Oh, you know, the other thing about it as well is that, you know, there are... There are, you know, some people who are happy to use apps and always go online for all their information and whatsoever. And then there's others who really like to have a cookbook. And this cookbook has been translated into six different languages. And in the first four months of being launched, which was now a few years ago, um, 20,000 copies were sold. You know, and I didn't realize you know, excuse the pun, but I didn't realize there's such an appetite. I didn't realize there'd be so many people interested in this cookbook. And, you know, it, uh, it really, really is a salutary tale that we can translate our science into something, hopefully, that will be useful. I think that's, that's a very true and such a very uh, unexpected part of our job. Did you ever expect being a, a molecular biologist into cancer uh, research, I can't think of a better way of putting that off the top of my head quickly, you'd end up writing a cookbook, for example. How cool an outcome is that? Yeah, no, I, I never thought of it. Um, I never imagined it. And actually, um, that's one of the wonderful things about being a researcher, though, because your career can go in so many different, you know, different directions, unexpected um, you know, side, side avenues that you might pursue that then become really dominant as well and important for you and important for the, for the research as well. So yes, we're, we're really, really pleased about that project. Um, and now the latest thing is, there's actually uh, with Daphne Economou in computer science, um, we are working on developing something which we're going to, it's currently what we're, Working title is Phyto app, but it's going to be, or, or Phyto as the Greeks would say, as in P-H-Y-T-O. Um, and it's to do with calculating the amounts of phytoestrogens within uh, an individual's diet and also look at the other nutrient contents in order to then trial out um, a mobile app, which it will then be useful for monitoring patients in a prospective manner um, and pushing some into different categories and then looking at outcomes. 
Um, so that's a that's a crossover project, interdisciplinary one, between myself, obviously as cancer biologist, Claire Robertson with the dietary side of the work, and then Daphne Economy with the mobile apps, um, and a new PhD student who's who's getting going on that work. So we're very excited on that. And um, I'm just going to mention it, so we have it recorded, but our colleague Claire Robinson, who I'm going to have on one day, a nutritionist and a fantastic conversation. So I think she'll be a great episode one day. Look out for that one. But you mentioned this idea of uh, different directions and a, re a research career leading you in different directions. And so to go off in some different directions here, just as we start to finish up, uh, besides the cancer research, besides cookbook, besides all this work we've been talking about, you are the lead of the diversity and inclusion research community. So that's a very different direction from everything we've talked about so far. So tell me about this part of your life. Well, I got the opportunity to consider this um, because as you know, the University of Westminster established four new research communities, overarching um, communities to bring together our researchers under themes that are important for us. And um, the other three are very much around topic areas where there's clear cognate groups already within the university. Um, this fourth one on diversity and inclusion was something I was really, really interested in because I know that my own work has been directed from my own perspective. And, you know, we have the freedom as academics oftentimes to direct our work and that based and that, that is based on oftentimes again our own experiences or the experiences of others that we read about. Um, but I'm very aware that a lot of research, especially medical research, which I know the most about, I suppose, um, has not always included all the voices that might need and benefit from the research. Um, and so I think that I can see that in cancer research, there's a need to broaden out and make sure that we really are representative and thinking about cancer as a global disease rather than being a, you know, Western European disease perhaps, which is the way that it, it has been perceived in previous decades. And now it's much more globalization and this view that we need to start to get the voices heard of individuals who oftentimes don't have agency, don't have the, the voice and who are underrepresented. So if you take just a shocking statistic um, that in the last census that was performed um, on the, on the um, UKRI doctoral researchers, which were awarded these uh, very prestigious sort of scholarships that are awarded for doctoral research. Only, well, less than 1% of those were awarded to people who are um, of black British origin. So out of 20,000 awarded um, over a three year period, less than 300 were awarded to individuals who are of black British origin. So those voices are not being heard in the research. There are a lot of people who have got a lot to, to contribute, but they're not necessarily being heard. And that you know can start to unpick, you know, all all the various reasons for that. Um, but I, being given the opportunity to lead this community, has given me a chance to bring people together to start to think about research from different perspectives. So. For example, thinking perhaps about legal aspects which might affect women's progression in different disciplines or all sorts of different aspects. And we've got these themes now which we've mapped out across the university as being key things, themes where we have strength and where we can build to start to have a better representation of different underrepresented groups in research and understand what that means. So. I think that in summary on that one, we are losing out, um, apart from the moral imperative, of course, but uh, just on a sort of personal level, I think we're, we're losing out and on the, on the richness that we could be benefiting from because we don't always necessarily recognize that people are being shut out of conversations and we need to start to include them. And that, 
if we don't have the researchers with those backgrounds to include them, then we should be actively going and re trying to reach out to those communities and say to them, how can we better um, help your community to participate either in research or to um, be properly represented in this particular sphere. So I came at it from a cancer research perspective, but it's a much bigger endeavor now. And I think as a university, we want to push this um, work because we know that we have the potential to make a good contribution in this area, um, whether that's on language research or migration research or health or the many different themes that we have, which we've mapped out. And, you know, we want to really push this and start to get this on the agenda. So partly a moral imperative, but also um, an opportunity to do something different, but I hope worthwhile. Mm. Yeah. It is, um, like I say, different, but worthwhile. And I, I like the example you gave earlier in terms of bringing value to your specific research in terms of the, um, the point you made about observations of breast cancer distribution in China versus the UK. Yeah. Yeah. And in a Western European funding model, which historically, of course, we're focused on, we would have missed that. And that important observation led to an entire research avenue for your work in terms of dietary yeah. intervention, which yeah. is quite cool. So Professor of Cancer Research, uh, Diversity Inclusion Research Centre leader, uh, maintains a work-life balance somehow, which, believe in me, in academia, we do struggle with. Lover of sculpture as well, and art, as we've discovered today. Professor Miriam Dweck, it's been a pleasure having you here today. Thank you. Wonderful to talk to you. Unfortunately, that's probably all of, we've got time for today. So it only really remains for me to say thank you once again to Professor Dweck to talk to us about her work and her research uh, with some unexpected different avenues in there that we just had to talk about when they came up. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, don't forget to subscribe, whether or not you're listening in to the audio version or watching us on YouTube. Uh, if you'd like to find out anything more about Dr. Miriam Dweck and her work, I'll leave some uh, description and links below, including some more information about the Breast Cancer Cookbook. My name's Brad Elliott, and this has been this week's Different Conversation. <laughs>